first and foremost, thank you for coming to the webinar. We are here to talk a lot, a, a little bit about showcasing your work and how to present and publish assessment work. And we're going to tell you a little bit about the types of work that could be published, give you some thoughts on where you could showcase your work, and then some tips and tricks how to translate your work. We'll actually walk through an example. I have the pleasure of serving on this panel or really facilitating this panel uh, with our two guest panelists, Gina Polykonopoulos and um, Nick Curtis. Both are dear friends of mine I have known for a number of years. Nick is currently the Director of Assessment at uh, Marquette University, and he provides leadership and support to the Marquette community, including academic departments, core curriculum, co-curriculum, student learning outcomes, basically what an assessment director does at an institution, right? All the commas and ampersands. You can actually view Nick's uh, full panel, or I'm sorry, full bio on the website, but I always like to give a little bit of a um, personal introduction. Uh, I have had the pleasure of working with Nick, although not closely, but in kind of weird tangential circles. And um, I always find him to have very, very good advice for publishing your work. He is currently the editor in chief of the research and practice in assessment journal. And he'll tell you more about that. Uh, Gina is the associate director for curricular assessment at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, Northern Virginia. And she serves um, on different boards, as you can see there. Uh, her professional background includes higher ed assessment, grant program evaluation, clin clinical mental health research, uh, and educational research. Uh, she holds a PhD in, in, um, in, I'm sorry, in counseling education and supervision from my alma mater, Old Dominion University. And so I have known Gina and the reason I say that is because I think I saw Gina in a class number, a number of years ago. She probably doesn't remember that, though. Um, but then a few years later, we fell into each other's circles again through uh, the Virginia Assessment Group. And um, she is a very good colleague and has lots of good advice as well. All right. So that's uh, for the bios. That's all for the bios. Again, both bios are on the website, so you're welcome to uh, peruse those a little bit. And now's the time that I stop talking and I let Gina and Nick take over. So Gina, if you could tell us a little bit about the types of work that could be showcased. Thank you for that lovely introduction as well. Um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you over the years. Um, so when we think about the day-to-day -day work we do um, in assessment, we are not always thinking about how we can translate this into a publication or a presentation because we are just so incredibly busy doing our day-to-day -day work and wearing all the many hats that we do wear. But a lot of the work that we do can be valuable to share with our colleagues because perhaps they're in a similar situation. Um, perhaps they have um, an issue that or a problem they'd like to to solve and they can look to an example of the work that you're doing um, and take that and apply it to maybe their institutional context. And so when we think about what we do day to day, sometimes learning outcomes assessment, whether that might be something that's within a specific discipline or college, um, such as say counseling or nursing, um, whether it's across the institution in a way like general education or core assessment or even institutional learning outcomes, just to give a few examples. So you might think about writing about the project or assessment work that you're doing. Um, another example could be applying assessment findings for learning improvement. So what do you do with the findings from your assessment project? How do you implement them and how do you work with your faculty colleagues and staff colleagues to um, take what we found and um, implement some kind of action and refine our current practices. So that's valuable insights to share with your colleagues and an example of some of those we have a recent um, a recent special issue in research and practice and assessment on learning improvement. So if you want some examples about um, the kinds of publications 
that are about learning improvement, you can take a look there. And we have um, a link to resources. I think Disha will share in a little bit, a link to those resources. Some other things that you can share is not just the findings um, of the learning outcomes assessment or any kind of assessment you're doing, but you can also write about, present about the practices that you do. How do you do the things you do? Um, are you Have you developed a, a faculty learning community? Are you working with partners across the institution on meta assessment, um, engaging in collaborative committees across disciplines, um, or maybe you're helping a student affairs um, program assess the uh, effectiveness or some other kind of co-curricular activity. So not just the findings can be publishable, but also the what and how you're doing, what you're doing in your day-to-day -day work. Does anybody wanna add to that or should we go on? Nope. I think that was great. Um, and so as you're, you're thinking through and continuing to think through the types of work that you might be able to share with others that might be interesting to others, um, some other ideas, uh, you could look to the measurement side of your assessment work. Uh, say, for example, you're working with a program and you help them design a new instrument to, to measure a learning outcome, uh, or you refine an existing instrument. Um, you will may, uh, and hopefully may not, be surprised to know that many other people would be interested in that instrument as well, uh, because everybody is always looking for ways to uh, measure and assess well. Uh, you could also look at the methodology, the cycle or the framework of your assessment process itself. There are many different types of uh, methodologies around assessment, um, and your, your way of assessing at your institution is probably at least slightly different, if not quite different, uh, from another institution's. And having those discussions out in uh, academic circles can be really, really helpful. Uh, you could also think about, and, and Gina alluded to this a little bit, Partnerships, uh, both within and uh, outside of your own university. Uh, within your university, you might partner with those who are working on national surveys, things like the NESI or LibQual with your librarians. Uh, they can always uh, use help with those and uh, you might be able to provide a perspective that they may not have and they may be able to provide a perspective on your work that you may not have. So that's always helpful. Uh, others at your institutions, uh, your institution uh, might be really helpful uh, partnerships as well. Um, content experts, and by that, what we usually mean are faculty members across different disciplines. Um, you are probably, as an assessment person, working with faculty, or maybe working with faculty every day, uh, and maybe a different faculty member every day. Uh, I find that's the case for me. Um, and uh, you may just have an informal conversation with one of your faculty members about the work you're doing and how that might be interesting to share uh, in an academic form, um, whether it be a presentation or a publication. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, another uh, partnership you might consider are other assessment professionals, either on your own campus or outside of your own campus. Uh, for example, Gina and I have collaborated. Uh, we've never had an institutional affiliation that's the same. Um, but we've done work together across our different campuses and across our, our different contexts. Um, but uh, there might be assessment professionals, either disciplinary assessment professionals or other institutional assessment professionals at your own institution that would be very helpful for that as well. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. And you've made um, Julian Jones very happy because she is a librarian and uh, lo would love to partner across uh, uh, other, with other colleagues across her campus. So <laughs> I'm glad we made one person happy today. Um, all right, so uh, just oh, oh, technology here may have gotten the best of me. So let me see if this uh, won't work. But what we um, were going to do is have you uh, come up with some different uh, uh, ideas of the work that you're currently working on or have worked on. So Gina and Nick shared with you uh, some thoughts on the types of work that could be published or presented. And uh, technology has gotten the best of me. We were going to have you type some of those ideas into a Slido slide, however, you're welcome to type some of those ideas into the chat or the Q&A. Um, what are some things that you are currently working on or have worked on? 
that you could think about publishing or presenting. And we'll give people just a few seconds to think about that. Uh, Gina and Nick gave some really, really good examples. I'm guessing when they were talking, you said, oh yeah, I do that. Um, or, oh yeah, I could, I could do that. Um, so we'll give a second or two. And sorry about the technology sat snafu, but any, any examples in the chat or the Q&A? Oh, chat is disabled. Well, I think it's disabled for everybody, Jessica. So uh, in the Q&A, if you could actually um, uh, type in your uh, answer. I'll give you a few minutes, but while we wait for everybody to do that, I will go ahead and move on. And uh, oh, actually, Carrie put in something, working on a committee that's developing developing a measure and there's intention to publish. Very, very good, Carrie. So you're already thinking from the beginning. A lot of times uh, as assessment and IE professionals, we think at the end, right? We're a little bit reactive, but being proactive with this. And that's the key to this webinar, right? Is to get you thinking at the beginning of what could be published or presented. So thank you, Carrie. Uh, Matthew talks about increasing DEI and competency-based assessment. Yes, thank you, Matt. Actually, I saw your presentation, I think it was at AALHE, um, or, or maybe it was the Assessment Institute. I cannot remember, but that is a very, very, very good idea. There's a lot of DEI work that needs to be done and is being done, so very, very good. And we have a few more here. I won't read everybody's because our webinar is only one hour long. Um, but here's another one, um, proprietary. Somebody used a proprietary assessment for almost 10 years and they're looking at maybe implementation or results over time. Very, very good. Gina or Nick, are there any ideas in the Q&A that strike you as something uh, interesting? I highlighted a few. Would you like to highlight a couple? Yeah, there's some great examples um, in the Q&A here. Um, one that caught my eye was um, like, uh, by Carrie, I'd like to consider something on changes made based on assessment findings. You know, we're always looking for more examples of that. Um, I, I love seeing how people have reflected on their practices and, and done something to tweak it or what kinds of insights come from the process because that's sort of the end game for us, right? It's a continuous thing. We, we do this. So anytime you can share what you actually did with our assessment findings, it just, uh, it's, it's exciting. Very good. Thank you, Gina. Absolutely. Nick, is there, is there one that strikes you or you'd like to highlight? There are a couple here that mention rubrics. Um, and I know rubrics are not um, always new things in the assessment world, right? Um, but rubrics are by no means something that we've all figured out. Uh, and I think uh, more and more, I, I think it's one of those things that's coming back into uh, the forefront uh, of research in assessment right now is how to develop good, effective rubrics that not just evaluate something, but also give information that, as Gina was saying, can help us do something with those findings. Um, because a, a rubric can be good psychometrically uh, or and or can be good at helping us actually make changes, uh, but both, uh, they don't overlap, right? Just because one is good at one doesn't mean it's always good at both. Um, so thinking through those, I think that could be a really nice topic. Um, Very good, thank you very much. Okay, so we will ignore my technology snafu and we will go on to the next slide here. And I believe Nick, uh, you're gonna tell us about showcasing our work. Yeah, so once you've figured out something that you might want to share with others, uh, the question then becomes how, where, um, how are you going to do that? Uh, and so we'll suggest a few places. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but it's one that might help you get some ideas. So the first place you might think about is publications. Uh, and this is one that's near and dear to my heart as the Editor-in-Chief of Research and Practice and Assessment, which is an example of the first bullet point there, which is journals or other related periodicals. Of course, Research and Practice Assessment is not the only uh, option for you. Uh, if you're trying to do research with methodology and literature review and data and results, that's a good place for it. Um, but you may have uh, other foci. 
um, or an, another uh, level of uh, your work that you wanted to, to share. Um, so places like AALHE's Intersection or Emerging Dialogues, um, the uh, J-A-A-I-E, J-A-H-E, um, Assessment Update, uh, and again, not an exhaustive list, but there's many publications, periodicals, journals out there in the assessment world um, that are, are great resources, uh, not only for us to go and find work, but also to share work with others. Um, and then something that's not considered, uh, I think, as often in our field, um, but could be, um, is we, we have some examples of professional blogs, uh, such as Linda Susky's blog, um, and there are a few others. Um, so that might be something you could consider starting even at your own university um, as a way to share work uh, amongst your colleagues at university and outside of your university. Oh, am I doing the presentation? Sorry. Oh, sorry, Gina. Yes. <laughs> I thought I was like, wow, Nick, that was really good. You know, yeah. you, got them all. <laughs> you got so many. Okay, yes. Yeah, so another, thank you, Nick. So another place we could um, consider sharing our work, aside from writing it out and publishing it, is uh, sharing it at a conference, whether that's in person or online. Um, whether it's a local conference um, like Virginia Assessment Group, which is uh, home to me, um, or something uh, national like AALHE or IUPUI, um, you can share your work with your colleagues in assessment. Something that um, came up earlier about partnerships, though, um, you can even think outside the box a little bit with this. If you're partnering with a faculty member, it doesn't necessarily have to be an assessment conference. You could, um, be, when working with a faculty member on an assessment project, maybe they're going to a conference in their own discipline and want to share what they've done with, the, with their assessment findings, and you can partner with them on that. So it doesn't just have to be uh, assessment conferences or even publications. It could be a related disciplinary publication. Um, you could do things uh, like webinars or a podcast, um, YouTube uh, videos. Um, you could, when submitting a presentation to a conference per se, you could do a, like a roundtable dialogue discussion, um, maybe in, participate in a panel or a poster session. Um, there's, so there's all sorts of different ways you can share your work. And I guess depending on what type of project it is, um, how big of a project it is, or sort of where you're at in your uh, sharing your work journey, you can enter that field. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. You can sort of enter um, this process in different ways. Hey, excellent. Thank you, Gina and Nick. And you can see there, there is a QR code um, and uh, or a tiny URL, however you'd like to access it. Uh, there is a list of resources, some professional organizations, some journals, some ideas on where to showcase your work. Real quick, technical thing. Uh, people wanted to see the question and answer. They wanted to see the ideas. I have reopened the questions um, for people to see other people's questions. Uh, so you should be able to see people's ideas and topics, all right? And let's go ahead and go on to the next one. And Nick, I believe you'll talk to us about what to think about. Yeah. So uh, as we were considering uh, what, we, what was important to share with you all today, uh, we were thinking about uh, as you were developing your idea, what are the questions that we think about when we're developing ideas for either publication or presentation? Uh, because honestly, the questions are, uh, they overlap quite a bit, uh, no matter where you are planning to share your work. Um, and so we really think these key questions will help you out. So uh, first couple questions, um, yeah, the first questions here are not the first questions that we would suggest thinking about. Um, so I'll, I'll do this in slightly different order. So the first thing you wanna do is think about the story you want to tell. Um, and uh, for me personally, I like to start with the why. Why am I interested in sharing this project? Why would others want to know? Um, why did I start doing this work in the first place? Um, what what, what uh, questions was it answering? What problem was it attacking? Um, then I like to think about how best to tell that story. Um, is it best in a presentation format uh, where I can talk with people, I can get feedback, we can have conversations? Or is it best in a publication uh, format where you put the work out there and still have conversations later, but really it's more of a directional modality where you are, you're putting it out there uh, for, for other people to consume. Um, 
then you want to think about who is the audience, uh, what is the what are the requirements of the format you've chosen. Um, so whether it's presentation or uh, publication, you want to think about the length of of that. Is it a fifteen minute presentation? Is it an hour presentation? Is it a three hour workshop? Um, or if it's a, a, a publication of some type, is it a five hundred uh, word uh, summary? Is it a one or you know five page um, kind of overview or is it a full 20 to 30 page article? Um, you wanna think about the format of the modality you've chosen. If, uh, for example, you were to come to RPA, we have a very specific format that you need to present things in. Um, or if you're going to submit it to a conference, they often have formats that they want you to uh, present things in as well. Uh, it's really important to adhere to those. Um, you want to think about if there are topical requirements. Sometimes journals have a very specific topic that they'd like you to submit under. Um, conference is the same, they might have tracks. Um, so you wanna think about that as you're, you're preparing uh, to consider how to put your presentation or publication together. Um, and then one thing we always like to uh, suggest is have a colleague look it over before submitting. Uh, and we, we found that to be extremely helpful in everything that we've submitted ourselves. Um, and that could be an assessment colleague, it could be a non-assessment colleague. Um, it's just someone not you. Uh, I think we've all had the experience where we look at it and we read it how we expect it to look, but we miss things like uh, spelling errors or punctuation errors or just content errors. Um, you know, that may or may not have happened when we were putting this together. Uh, so um, it's always really helpful uh, to do that. Uh, thank you, Nick. And I think the other piece of that, yes, grad, uh, graduation, grammar and spelling errors, but also, you know, as assessment and IE people, we can get a little jargony. So having a non-assessment person uh, look at that might be helpful as well. So good advice here. And now we come to a, a very interesting part of our webinar where Gina is actually going to um, walk us through a little example. So Gina, please take it away. Oh boy. <laughs> so we talked about, well, I think Nick talked about uh, sort of the different outlets that are out there where you could submit your work if you're thinking about uh, publishing. Uh, and then I talked about presenting. So um, we'll just go with one of these examples here. So you've got peer reviewed scholarly journals like Research and Practice and Assessment um, or like Intersection um, by AALHE. Um, but then you've also got writing for a professional community. An example of that is Emerging Dialogues, and that's the one I'll take you through today. Um, it's a good place to, to start if you haven't um, published before and you have uh, an idea that you'd like to write about. Um, it's submitted to a committee and the committee reviews it and provides very helpful feedback. So once I learn how to share after two years, <laughs> I will take you through Take you through here as an example. So this is the AALHE website, um, and you'll see across the top they have publications. So um, here's the example of a journal intersection, and here is emerging dialogues, which is what I'll take you to uh, this time. And so it, you can look, and this is pretty much similar in all of the different publication outlets that you'll go to. There will be um, a description of what type of publication it is, perhaps um, what type of articles. Um, they publish what sorts of topics, maybe there's a special topic. And so when you go to that publications uh, website, you can see all of that information there. So for example, this one um, looks for short articles uh, about how institutions or programs work uh, toward learning improvement through assessment. Uh, sometimes there's special uh, issues on that or different topics. And then there will always be some kind of guidelines for publication where um, potential authors will click on the guidelines and uh, it will tell you a little bit more about what they expect from people who are submitting an article for publication. So here, for example, they'll tell you about the length, things like Nick was talking about, um, thinking about your idea and your audience, um, what sorts of topics you might see people write about that are going to fit with that uh, specific publication because every journal or periodical or or sort of every outlet has their own kind of um, 
flavor. Uh, and so to get an idea of the things that people will, uh, different outlets will publish, um, you can look at their previous publications and also their guidelines for publications. And then they always have sort of instructions, um, like down here, there's a submission form on how to get that to be considered for publication. And so here, like for this one in particular, you can take a look at previous articles and get an idea of, um, you know, the type of article that you might see in this publication. So this one is open access. So for example, you could click on it and you'll be able to read the article and you can get an idea of, oh, this is the kind of article that this outlet publishes. So that's sort of like a quick little walkthrough from me. I'll stop sharing now. Okay, and while I get um, my screen back up, I, I agree with Gina. Uh, after two years of doing Zoom, it seems that uh, I uh, have difficulty finding all the, the buttons. So let me share my screen again. Actually, what we might do is, um, Nick, do you want to share your screen and maybe pull up an example with RPA? Sure, sorry. Um, so uh, thanks again, Gina. Uh, my thanks to that, uh, for taking us through there. Um, so in case you're wondering how it might differ for a for research and practice assessment, which is a peer reviewed double blind um, publication. Um, I'll take you through. You'll see some similar things. You'll see some slightly different things. Uh, so here's our front page. Um, this is rpajournal.com. And the most useful place for you to go as someone considering sharing your work is the author's page, uh, which is right here. Um, and the author's page has all of the submission guidelines. So as I said earlier, there were some journals have uh, ways in which they'd like you to submit things, ways in which they'd like you to categorize, categorize things, and RPA is no different. Um, we look for things that fall into one of three large buckets. Assessment practice, which includes what you see here, assessment measurement, which includes what you see here, and assessment policy and foundations, which includes uh, the, the sub uh, points here. Um, we give in this uh, description exactly the type of articles we're looking for. Uh, for example, uh, articles should be no more than 6,000 words. That's about 16 pages. Um, we do, uh, of course, uh, make exceptions to that for when the circumstances uh, arise, since we are a uh, uh, online journal. We don't have actual pages to worry about. Um, we have certain special topics that come up. Uh, for example, learning improvement. We have a learning improvement corner that when a learning improvement article comes in, we're really interested in, in getting that out and making sure we have special attention to that. Um, and again, that's just use of results in meaningful ways. We have special features um, and also how to submit. Um, and so this is a really good page and you'll find this type of page on any publication um, and you'll find something akin to this on any um, presentation um, that you might be submitting uh, if it's to IEPUS Assessment Institute or AALG's conference or uh, an assessment conference like SAC COC or um, Higher Learning Commission they all will have something like this saying exactly what they are looking for they also will have uh, often a theme Right, especially if it's a conference, they'll say our theme for this year is you know X, Y, and Z. Um, and so anything you can do to link your work to that theme is going to help you out uh, in the review process. Um, and I think that is probably the most helpful thing on on this page for you. Um, if we have time, we may come back and I'll dive down a little bit deeper, um, but I, that's a good overview. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Nick. And um, Nick has done this presentation. I think I saw this at uh, Assessment Institute or the Virginia Assessment Group. He does a wonderful presentation on um, the rubric they use, I believe, and some other things about, uh, some other tips and tricks about publishing in the RPA journal. Uh, so both of both of our panelists, as you can see, have uh, a lot of experience, and um, they are experts. They have 
I did not share this uh, with you in their introduction, but both are very accomplished uh, presenters and publishers. Um, so please, please, please type in your, ans your answers, your questions in the Q&A so they can respond. Um, there's a lot of good uh, advice that they can give, but only if they have some questions. All right, so we will continue to move forward as you think of some good questions and get some more knowledge from these two experts. I believe here this next one is still Nick. So Nick, take it away. Yeah, uh, so again, as we were thinking about um, advice that we would give you as you're considering how to best think about sharing your work, um, we realized that you may be at a point that you are not quite ready or comfortable um, thinking about that yet, um, but you still might want to get involved in some way. Uh, and we thought about what were the ways that we got into this type of work? How, where were our points of entry? Um, and this is what we came up with. And we think these are really good recommendations for you if that's where you are uh, in, in the process. So the first is to consider serving on committees and boards. Um, and this could be across a wide range of either publication uh, outlets or presentation outlets, uh, but boards uh, for things such as conference planning. Um, so all three of us, uh, Tisha, Gina, and I, were all on, at some point, VAG, Virginia Assessment Group's board. Um, and there's a lot of conference planning involved uh, in that and a lot of work uh, for that, but really, really valuable experience. Um, and I think we would all agree that something that has really helped us as we consider our own presentation and publications. Um, also, you could think about being on professional organizations such as VAG, AALHE, um, IEPY, Assessment Institute, um, so uh, those things uh, provide an invaluable experience. Um, you could also volunteer for conferences, um, things like session hosts or uh, manning registration desks or providing room directions. These things are really integral to the success of those conferences and you kind of get a backstage tour of what it looks like uh, to help run or to manage that type of work. Um, it can really give you some insight into what people are looking for and how to craft your proposals to really fit in with something, a culture uh, for a particular uh, presentation venue. Um, you could also become a reviewer, and this is both for a journal or a conference. Um, both have a need for reviewers of the proposals. Um, so for RPA, for example, um, we have peer reviews. Uh, and so uh, we, anytime we get an article and reviewing it, we send it out to peer reviewers. They provide feedback and recommendations and we use that to make decisions and to give feedback to the authors. Uh, but uh, conference proposals are very similar, right? The proposals go out to reviewers, uh, feedback is given and that feedback is used to make decisions about um, who is accepted and uh, who isn't. Um, and so that process, uh, I think more than any other, can give you a lot of insight into what uh, people are doing, what works, what doesn't, um, and can really uh, give you a, a boost into this whole area of uh, sharing your work with others. Thank you, Nick. And Siobhan talked a little bit about becoming a reviewer. I'll talk about, I know, um, I'll talk about some conference conference reviewers and maybe Nick, you can talk about becoming a reviewer for a journal. And then Gina, you can talk about becoming a reviewer for uh, AALAG publications. But Siobhan, first, um, I, I have been a reviewer for, um, I did the SAC COC conference uh, three years in a row. Um, and all I did was, <laughs> Uh, send an email to the planner and said, hey, do you need a volunteer? And of course the answer was yes, they are always as, um, they always need volunteers. Um, you can do that if you're not in the SAC COC region, you can do that with almost any regional. Um, if you find the, the um, events planner or conference planner, it's, uh, it's usually called events or, or meetings planner, something like that. If that's not the right person, they'll get you to the right person. They're always looking for things. Um, same with the Virginia Assessment Group and AALHE, they're looking for volunteers. So sending an email is typically how you get on those um, reviews for conference proposals. Nick, how about you talk about RPA and then Gina, you can talk about uh, um, emerging dialogues and other. 
Yep. Uh, so RPA is very similar. Um, we, if, if you'd like to become a reviewer, uh, send an email uh, to to me at editor at rpajournal.com. Um, and don't worry, you don't need to remember that. Uh, it'll be in the resources. It's on the website. Um, and we have a, a pool of reviewers and we match by subject expertise and interest. Uh, so if you want to become a reviewer and you're unsure because you think that you might get something that you're not comfortable with, you don't need to worry about that uh, because you tell us what you're interested in reviewing. And when we have something that matches, we try to match you with that. Um, and if you're asked to be a reviewer on something and you don't feel comfortable with it, you have the opportunity to say that you don't feel comfortable with it. And could you just um, send me the next one uh, instead of this one? And we, we do that all the time. Um, so very similar. And um, I guess I'll, I'll pick up and talk a little bit. I'm seeing something happen in the Q&A that I, I kind of, it parallels something I wanted to mention. So these points of entry that we're talking about, they kind of all have the thread of service and networking. And so the way that sometimes we get started on these projects is just by meeting people who have similar interests. And um, like right now I'm seeing in the Q&A, a couple of folks talking about the same thing, let's connect on this one particular topic. And that's kind of how it starts. It's like you have an idea, you have shared experiences, you can kind of bounce ideas back and forth off of each other and then say, hey, maybe we can share this with our colleagues who might also find it valuable uh, to know what we're doing as an example. And so, um, you know, getting involved in your local, regional, and or national organizations is an excellent entry point. Um, that's how it happened for me. Um, and I think for, for many of us, um, the example of of uh, being a member of say ALHE, you can serve on a committee such as Emerging Dialogues or Intersection, and um, they will you know, teach you how to review the submissions that come in um, and you can sort of develop that way. Um, and so another thing I wanted to mention was, you know, just uh, expanding your net network on things like the listserv. So we ask each other questions all the time on these listservs. And um, I personally can attest to, several uh, research projects, presentations, uh, and uh, publications that have come because I've seen somebody post something or I've posted something and uh, we've then connected offline because we kind of had an idea exchange going on. Um, and so I just really think that the network and service are two really important points of entry when it comes to getting started with publishing and presenting. Very, very good point there, uh, Gina, with the listservs. Yeah, if you see the chatter and the listservs and you're connecting with people. I have um, here a question from Lee and Nick. I'll let you start and, and Gina, you can chime in. Thinking of a journal article, what are kinds of papers or topics you think we, the field, needs more of? Could be specific to RPA or general? That's a great question. Um... So I, I can give you some example topics that I think are um, really in demand right now. Um, but honestly, the the range of topics that are appropriate and really in need right now are as diverse as the things that we can possibly apply our assessment knowledge to. Um, so if, if you're assessing it or if you're helping assess something at your institution, it's probably of interest to others. Um, and really, that is one of the number one things that I think about when I, I'm considering presenting is, will this be interesting and will it apply outside of just my context? If it's something that's really cool, but it's only going to work right where I am, it's probably not a great thing uh, to consider for publication or presentation. Um, but if there's a possibility that it could help someone else, I, I think that's when you start getting into the realm of things that are really, really interesting there. Um, but to answer your question more directly, um, things like uh, assessment around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, assessment that includes diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, are, those topics are very, very um, in demand right now, and, and rightfully so. Um, continuing the idea of assessing high impact practices uh, and, and what that might mean moving forward, learning improvement, and uh, using results for, for change and improvement. Um, Student affairs and co-curricular assessment is really uh, in demand right now. And then uh, partnering with students in the assessment process and how that can improve our processes and help everything move forward better. 
Nick, you didn't leave me very many. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think, I think um, gosh, um, so I guess to round out what you're saying, um, you've touched on this. It's, I really think collaborative practice is something that the field likes to see a lot more of now. Um, we are trying to um, continue to reach across the institution and reach different partners. Student partnerships, like Nick said, is a, a really uh, important one. Um, also partnering with librarians, uh, assessment librarians is another excellent um, place to go. And uh, again, student affairs assessment. Uh, I just think that the way that we collaborate with uh, our colleagues across the institution. And anytime we do that, sharing how we do that and how it's helped improve student learning from any kind of angle is gonna be valuable. Thank you to the both of you. And I want to echo what Gina said something earlier uh, in the Q&A, &A, something cool is happening. Some collaboration is uh, organically taking place if for some reason, I don't want this to be, you know, I met a person on a train and then I never saw them again. They got off at their stop. Um, I met a person on a webinar and I never got their email. If for some reason you want to collaborate with somebody, please send me an email and um, I will reach out to them and, uh, and try to connect all of you. So, um, but try to get each other's emails before the end of the webinar. I don't want 70 emails about, hey, I wanna connect with Noreen or anything like that, but uh, try to get people's emails. If for some reason you miss people's contact information, just send me an email. All right, so some really good points here. And another takeaway, I love a handout. I love a takeaway. And what I love more than a handout is um, an actual worksheet. And so uh, we created this worksheet here and let me actually um, change, let me pause my sharing. If you go to that QR code or um, that tiny URL, I'll give you a second to capture that. Um, and what I'm going to do is share, um, share this screen with you. And hopefully everybody can see this screen. And this is your um, template for making a plan. Um, don't worry if you didn't get that QR code or a tiny URL, I'll put it up on the screen. If you want to use this, you certainly don't have to, please make a copy of it or download it um, and, and save it to your personal computer because this is for everybody to use, not just not just one or two people, not just anonymous chameleon or um, anonymous bat. Uh, so here we just have a few questions or a few ideas to spark um, your plan. So we are assessment and IE people, right? What is your goal? You know, really, really think about your goal. Uh, and it could be something as, you know, to... Um, Tisha, sorry to jump in, Tisha. We cool. can't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. you know, I, I did not click resume share. I have to also say this. Can you see it now? Thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. I actually was 20 minutes into a face to face presentation in October. And I thought there was something on the screen behind me and there was nothing. And you know, nobody told me anything. So thank you, Gina, for telling me there was nothing on the screen. All right. So, um, so this is your worksheet and I can see um, a few people grabbing it. So just walk, working through your plan, you know, what is your ultimate goal, um, you know, to publish in a peer review journal, to um, present at a national conference, or it could be something like to collaborate with a colleague on a state uh, conference presentation. And, you know, Gina, Nick, and I mentioned a lot about Virginia Assessment Group and AALHE and IUPUI Assessment Institute. Uh, those are the ones that we are most familiar with. I mean, there are many, many out there. There's Texahia. There's one in New England, I believe. There's a um, one in Pennsylvania or Philadelphia. Again, some of those are on your resource uh, handout that I shared earlier. So it, that could be your goal. Then really brainstorming the projects that you have worked on or currently working on, kind of some of the questions we asked earlier. What do they showcase? So thinking about their showcasing and then so forth, the outcomes of the project, the findings. 
um, or, or not necessarily the findings, but what was, um, or who would be interested in the findings or the process. So that thinking about audiences, and as we talked about earlier, it doesn't have to be an assessment conference or assessment publication. It could be a disciplinary one. It could be a faculty development one. That's another um, avenue for assessment in IE professionals. So um, really working through your plan is something that uh, could help you. And guess what? We're up on the new year. So what do we all do in the new year? We make New Year's resolution. Maybe some of us do, some of us don't. Um, but uh, the new year is a time of renewal and a time of rethinking maybe your goals and your plan for the next year or two. So this might be a good opportunity for you to say in 2023, um, I'm going to present for 2023, I am going to publish. All right, so let me stop sharing there. Uh, thank you for the comments. And, um, and now I feel like I've uh, created a matching webinar. People are putting their emails in the Q&A. And so uh, let me share my screen again and get back to the presentation. Okay, thumbs up. We can see that QR code, right, everybody? Thank you very much. Okay, I, you know, I, after doing this a few times, I should start asking people, hey, can you see my screen? Um, all right, so moving on. We have, the get, we have um, shared with you a lot of valuable information. Nick and Gina have leveraged their depth of experience and shared some tips and tricks. I see some connections happening. Um, in the Q&A, this is your opportunity to ask some questions of the experts. These are people that have published and presented. Um, these are people who are editors or uh, review proposals, conference and publication proposals. They're the ones that can really answer some of your questions. So I'll give you a minute or two to type in the chat uh, some of your questions. Actually, here's one from anonymous attendee. What advice do you have for selecting a journal to submit your work to? So I'll lean on Nick and then Gina, if you want to add anything, that's fine. Uh, in the interest of not, not saying everything again though, do you wanna go first? <laughs> Gina, <laughs> who me? <Yeah. laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so I really think um, uh, to me, like the questions that Nick referenced earlier, the, the audience and the why, you know, why do I want to share this? The answer to having a really solid answer to that question or those questions will help you select the right place to go. Um, and so usually that involves, okay, so my, my why might be, why do I want to share this assessment project that I'm working on? Let's see, right now I'm working on um, looking at written communication, uh, learning outcomes from uh, first year in a university to uh, the end of of their experience. And I'm trying to, to track their growth in that. Why do I want to share that? Because um, I think that it could be valuable to some of my colleagues at other institutions who are also assessing written communication. Maybe they'd like an example of how um, we are doing that over time, doing it in a more longitudinal way. So that, that would be my why. And then I would take that and think about, well, who is going to want to know about assessing written communication? Um, so I would think that um, maybe my fellow assessment colleagues might. And so that kind of narrows the field down, right? To I want to, I'm thinking of sharing this with assessment people. So I'm going to go to assessment um, journals, like the ones that we have in our list. Um, so, so just working through that really helpful uh, act, worksheet that Tisha uh, constructed there is going to help you um, decide uh, which avenue you want to go to. And I would suggest if you've never um, if you've never published before, like ever, and this is brand new to you, and you want to try and get started, you may want to to start with a um, an outlet that has smaller articles, um, such as emerging dialogues, where you can get feedback um, from folks on that committee, reviewers who can offer you feedback on how to strengthen um, your your article as well. So, Nick, your turn. <laughs> All right. Great, great advice. Um, the uh, only thing I'll add is a practical, um, practical, some practical advice. Um, go and look at what articles the journal publishes. Right. Go and read a few. Read through some of the abstracts. 
Um, and if it sounds kind of like what you're thinking about doing or what you have done, might be a really good place for it. If it sounds absolutely nothing like it and you've read through you know, half a dozen or so and you're like, I don't think I this is related, it might not be the right place for you. Um, because uh, you know, I, the example that comes to mind is you have a very practical, uh, practice-oriented piece and the journal articles you pull out are really heavily technical and, and focus in the weeds on the measurement concepts of, of development. Um, those two things might not align. Uh, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean your work or their work is any less uh, than it was before. It just means it's not perhaps the right outlet for it. Um, so that's what I often do is as I'm deciding where to submit a piece, I will look at what has been submitted, especially recently from that journal. That is excellent advice. Thank you, Nick, um, especially looking at the types of articles, Nick and Gina, looking at the types of articles, but then also the subject matter um, or the audience. First year experience journals, um, student development journals, you can really think outside the box. It doesn't necessarily have to be assessment. Um, one of the other things that, uh, that you could do is um, uh, talk with, um, oh, I wanted the, one of the things I wanted to say uh, while Nick was talking, uh, there are some low um, entry, uh, low barrier entry weight points, you know, local conferences, national conferences are, are a little bit more. And then, you know, peer reviewed journals are kind of a little bit higher entry points. Uh, if this is your first time presenting, or if you're new to the assessment field, or if you're not quite sure, I really, really highly recommend, my mentor told me to do this, Worth Pickering, Start with the state organization, do or a, a regional organization um, like Texahia or Virginia Assessment Group or some others in New England. And I'm sure there's some in California, but I don't know them. Um, start with one of those organizations and present. From there, think about presenting at a national conference like um, accreditation conferences or assessment institute. From there, think about publishing. So you can turn your presentations into publishing, but what his advice to me was, don't, don't, you know, shoot for the moon on the fur. I'm going to shoot for the RPA or a peer review journal when I've never published, you know, start, start at a, a, a different entry point. That's not to say you can't um, write an article for RPA. That's not to say that, but I'm not going to ask Gina or Nick. Uh, to answer this, but I am sure they have been rejected a few times for different publications, maybe not, um, but there are some, some, sometimes you don't get accepted the first time, and so just be thinking about that. I know I personally have been rejected from several publications and presentations, um, but you just keep going. All right, A any other questions from uh, the group, from the participants out there. I don't see any more in the chat and while or in the Q&A and while people are thinking about questions, Gina or Nick, is there anything else you'd like to add as we come up on our final minutes? I'll go first with, uh, we'll go with Gina first. Oh, I was just going to piggyback off what you said, you know, like because um, it can be kind of scary um, to submit your work to sort of the abyss of the internet land. Um, if you've never done it before, where's my article going? Um, I'm just gonna submit this. I did all this hard work, um, but you know, this, this field is a very friendly field um, and we're very collegial. And, um, you know, so, and I think that when things aren't, you know, uh, accepted uh, into journals or, or are rejected, you know, uh, scary, um, I think it's usually just about the audience and fit. You know, not necessarily that what you're doing doesn't have value or isn't important, just that maybe it's the, a different kind of publication outlet or presentation outlet than would be best for what you want to share. And so trying to reframe it in that way and think about it, okay, let me try and think about where is it going to be the best fit. I know I personally have had um, people submit um, to one of the outlets that I've worked on in, in different ways and just saying, wow, this is great, but you know, I don't know if it really fits. And then personally saying to that person, you know, this over here, this outlet over here, that aligns great with what you want to share. Um, have you considered sharing over there? Um, not saying, 
not trying to be more inclusive about um, about this stuff. So being aware of what's out there, but sometimes if you're not, you know, just knowing that someone can help point you in the right direction if you're unsure. Thank you, Gina. Those are very nice final thoughts. And Nick, how about you? Yeah, uh, I'll echo that. Um, building off of it uh, a little bit, uh, if there's somewhere that you're considering uh, submitting to uh, and you've done everything we've said already um, and you're still not sure if it's the right place, um, you can often find a contact email. Uh, I can say for RPA specifically, you can send a, a message to us, uh, the editorial team, and say, here's what I'm thinking about submitting. Here's, you know, here's exactly what I'm, I'm doing. Is this appropriate, right? Um, and, and we'll give you feedback uh, before you do the formal submission. Um, so like Gina was saying, that's just a version of the collegiality that you find in this field. Um, now, some more old fashioned journals may not look kindly on that. Um, so, you know, make sure that it, it's something uh, you know, that it seems appropriate, but, you know, in, in the assessment field, I can say for sure, if you do that with any of the publications, presentation outlets, uh, they'll be happy to, to give you feedback. That is true. Assessments, the cool and hip field. Is that what you're, <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. Well, we have come to the end. I don't see any more questions in the Q and A. We have come to the end of our webinar. Um, please, please, please join me in thanking both Gina and Nick for giving their time. Not, it wasn't just this webinar. We all know there's some prep time, so they had to sit with me for a few hours and go over our idea. And, uh, but also, like I said in the beginning, we have other webinars coming up in, the, in January. If you go to the Weave Education website and go under Knowledge Center, you'll find um, the Connections newsletter, the Accreditations uh, Conversations podcast, but also other offerings, courses, workshops, other webinars. So we have come to the end of our webinar and Gina and Nick, you're getting a lot of kudos in the um, chat. So thank you, thank you very much. You two are very, very good colleagues. I was very excited to do this with you and um, everybody hope to see you at another webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.